Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the THP Strength Podcast. Today, we are going to be covering flexibility and its impact on human performance. Um, I would like to give a special shout out to our advertisers, Legion Supplements. Um, the supplement industry is notorious for not actually having the ingredients listed in it. With Legions, they lab test all their products to ensure the purity. They also include clinically and effective dosages in all their products with links to the studies showing exactly why those ingredients are included. Use our code THP for 20% off your first purchase or two times reward points if you're a returning customer. And without further ado, let's get right into it. Um, I guess the first thing we're going to be doing is covering our personal experiences and anecdotes um, in terms of flexibility and it, how, how we've had it help, not help, any of that stuff. John, you want to kick it off with, with your experiences? Yeah, yeah, I can start. My experiences are extensive in terms of elite track and field, so I can draw from most of my experiences there, in particular working with Aries Merritt, Andre de Grasse, Greg Rutherford, Fabrice Lapierre. Each one of those guys uh, had a very different approach to static flexibility. The sprinters generally speaking did not do a lot of static flexibility especially before sessions that makes sense because we'll get into why but the research is pretty clear that it does not help right before you do a speed power event it doesn't help with reducing injury and it also does not help with improving performance so the elite sprinters did not do static flexibility before beforehand Aries Merritt, because he was a hurdler and he had to have very good mobility to get over the hurdles appropriately Actually, a lot of the hurdles, hurlers would do a decent amount of static flexibility before their sessions. The long jumpers and sprinters, like I said, they did not. Fabrice Lapierre, guy jumps over eight meters. Greg Rutherford jumping over eight meters. Both of them Olympic World Championship medalists or Olympic medalists. Very rarely, if ever, did I see them do any static flexibility. Always dynamic, always making sure they did a full warm-up, a thorough warm-up, and focused more on the technical elements and just generally making sure that they were warm. My personal experiences, having been an athlete since as long as I can, a jumping athlete for as long as I can remember, static flexibility has consistently messed up my hips, caused knee pain, caused Achilles pain. It generally speaking messes up my connective tissue. And many people will be like, well, you didn't stick with it. Or you didn't do it. I've tried so many times. <laughs> every time I static stretch, not every time, but consistently I will pull my hamstring more often. I sometimes pull my hamstring stretching, which maybe is a sign I'm stretching too intensely. I generally speaking, don't improve my mobility nearly as much as I think I probably should be for how much time I'm spending on it. And my incidence of injury usually goes up when I'm focusing on stretching more and more and more. That's my personal experience at Duke. They would do it in the warmups a little bit they would do 15 to 20 seconds of, I want to say, maybe eight stretches. And there was some general consensus that it wasn't necessarily to improve mobility as much as it was to work on the team elements. Having everyone in a circle, being able to sit down, talk, develop those relationships amongst the team, see what sort of clicks form, who's sitting next to who, who's standing next to who, who's friends, who's not. That stuff can be very insightful as a coach. And we would generally use that as our time to assess how athletes are feeling, generally what their mood is, stuff like that. That was my experiences with it. There's a ton more, obviously. I could talk about Isaiah and his too, but I think he'll, he'll probably elaborate. When it comes to dynamic flexibility, I have also my own personal anecdotes. But as far as static flexibility, that is, that is my experience. I will say this, when I've needed mobility and I've done static flexibility, it has helped. So, Isaiah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I have a pretty extensive um, experience with static flexibility. Growing up, I did every sport imaginable, um, mainly basketball. I played football as well when I was in middle school and early high school. And every coach I ever had made us do static flexibility. They always told us about the importance of static flexibility. There's also this really popular um, Kobe Bryant video on the internet. It's, it's him giving his advice, and he gives seven tips out. And the very last tip he gives is he, he's literally like, you got to stretch. And then he talks about um, how he stretches every single day and how his dad is able to play basketball at the age of, like, 50 or something like that and because of all the stretching he does. 
Um, so hearing about all that, I used to do a lot of static stretching uh, growing up. Our coaches in basketball, they would make us stretch after practice. Um, they would, um, in football especially, like like John said, where it's like that team element and you, you go with, everybody sits in a circle and they take you through an entire stretching routine. Um, we are, I have like vivid memories of, of doing that when I was, when I was playing football. Um, and then as I started looking up like research and, and things like that, um, I like quickly found out that, uh, static stretching, um, it like decreases, um, force production. I think that's, that's like a really popular study. Um, and ever since then, then I looked up my own warm ups. Then I started including dynamic flexibility in my warm ups, stop static stretching as much. I would still do it after um my games and things like that um and then i stopped s stretching as much and then later on when i started getting knee pain i found kelly starrett and he has a book called the supple leopard um i ate that up he uses a lot of static stretching mainly the couch stretch and then he also advised to stretch I, I, he, he says to sit in a 10 minute squat every single day just a body weight squat you sit down and you sit in that squat so I started doing that um and then I remember that like had um a really big impact on my performance especially like the couch stretch um that helped my knee pain like temporarily um and then it would also make me feel better when I jumped um just because I feel like having having tight hips impedes your jumping um so that's kind of my general um, experience with it. Oh, and then and then later on, uh, when I found John and we actually started doing a proper load management protocol, I completely stopped stretching. Um, like literally would not stretch at all. And my knees became the healthiest ever, jumped my highest ever. Um, so that was the whole thing. And then later, later on, I did a very popular uh, program out there that, that recommends a lot of stretching. I started stretching every body part five minutes each body part and then i jumped lower after after doing all that so that that's kind of like it reinforced what i kind of already knew about static stretching that it doesn't really help inc increase human performance um and then n right now i'm back to doing very minimal amounts of static stretching i'll sometimes do it if i'm bored and like i just want to like not feel like like super lazy um, and, and do something. So I'll, I usually get, I'll do like a couch stretch or something like that, say in a squat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that very clearly and concisely sums up both of our experiences. Hunter, do you have anything you want to add to that as a baseball player trying to get your shoulder flexible or your back? I know that uh, your torso and your shoulder have to be, and your hips actually have to be really flexible to play baseball. <clears throat> Did you do a lot growing up or no? So. I was never really religious about stretching like I should have been. Uh, it's caused me a lot of issues, uh, especially with baseball, my right shoulder in particular. Um, I've never been a particularly flexible person. Uh, I kind of have tried to focus on uh, targeted stretching, if that makes sense, like focus stretching on only the parts of my body that I feel like actually need to have an increased uh, range of mobility. Where'd you get that? Um, just, I don't know, <laughs> picking it up through playing <laughs> sports. Uh, like, I feel like uh, you shouldn't just stretch just to stretch. You should stretch for a reason. And for me, with baseball, you needed a certain type of flexibility. But, like, I, I don't know, I kind of come from the belief that you only need to be as flexible as you need to be. And that being uh, hyper-flexible, hyper-mobile in ranges of motion that are hard to train or that you're not particularly strong in, you're just setting yourself up to get injured. So I tried to focus on uh, flexibility and ranges of motion that I needed to be in for my sport and that I could also train. Have you guys ever seen that athlete that is insanely flexible? Like women that can put their foot behind their, or dancers that can put their foot behind their head or like ballerinas who can hyperextend their elbows and their knees. And that's, that's the best cases I've seen. I don't see a lot of men that are that flexible as athletes, maybe hurdlers occasionally you see that. And I think the only dunker like that's Kadur. <laughs> yeah. And then you and then you kind of look at their ability to produce force and it just looks like they weeble, they wobble and they fall down. They just can't really stabilize forces or that there's a lack of strength in those positions. Have you guys ever seen that before? Yeah. 
Hunter. Have you ever seen that? Not so much. I think CrossFit is maybe one of the most interesting anecdotes to look at or case studies to look at because you have a lot of very heavily muscular muscled people that also are insanely mobile. Olympic weightlifters are another really good example, which obviously I have a lot of experience with. And if you listen to today's, the podcast I posted today, we're recording today that this will post tomorrow. You heard me discuss what their training was like and what my experiences were with those athletes. Having been there, you know, those athletes were insanely mobile. They could do full splits, full straddle splits. They could do overhead squats with ease. Deep squats were a breeze. They ankle mobility, wrist mobility, shoulder mobility was crazy. And consistently, I would notice that athletes that didn't have the requisite mobility would, they would get hurt more frequently because they couldn't hit the positions without freedom. There was passive tension in the joint and athletes that did have that mobility could hit positions a little bit more readily, but would tend to run into overuse injuries, injuries, or sometimes would get injuries like elbow hyperextension or knee, knee hyperextension, or they would have this joint laxity that was actually detrimental to their performance. And generally speaking, those athletes were not, they were, yes. looking back, I don't know if I could really say there was a trend, but there were a couple athletes that I remember that were so mobile and just so weak. <clears throat> they just were weak. They're crazy mobile, but just really weak. And where you found that middle ground, that's where you really saw pretty good athletes, but the ones that were the best were the most powerful ones, obviously, <clears throat> not the most mobile ones. So kind of looking at that might might be a good anecdote. Moving forward, I can kind of fall back on that as a way to discuss some of the specifics of how it impacted some of the most powerful athletes on the planet, specifically in a sport like weightlifting, and then what those athletes were like in terms of other sports as well, and if that had any indi indication of what type of athlete or how talented they were. That all said, we can get into some of the some of the research here and Isaiah I know you and I both before this started to read a little bit not a little bit I think we probably went through five or six studies each one of which was a systematic review with like 48 studies and generally speaking <clears throat> what you'll see is that acute stretching decreases performance in the short term if you're a speed power athlete <clears throat> so if you're a football player or you are a sprinter or you are a pro dunker and all of us have kind of corroborated this if you do static stretching before those events it's going to decrease your power output at least temporarily and that's a big reason for why you shouldn't do them acutely if you're trying to improve performance that said it doesn't tell you about the effect of chronic stretching on power output longitudinally longitudinally or chronically meaning okay well maybe if that's right before but what if you're doing it all the time? What if you have a consistent stretching protocol that you're doing every day to improve your mobility? Then what sort of impact does that have? And the systematic review, which had, again, I think 47 studies or something like that, 47, 48 studies, it was all over the place. The stretching research is all over the place. But the general consensus that it did say was static stretching is definitely not gonna improve your performance acutely. Is it gonna decrease injury? there's no indication it's gonna decrease injury. We don't really know what it's gonna do acutely. <laughs> I think it kind of falls back on the athlete and how they feel. And Isaiah, I don't know, before you do these big dunk sessions, do you feel like static stretching would help you if you did it beforehand? Do you feel like it would impede you? Do you even need it at all? Kind of what's your experience with that? Also, I gotta check on my dog one sec, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, as far as doing it before a big dunk session, um, it depends what muscles I'm focusing on doing the static stretching. Hold on, with. can you get closer to the mic, Isaiah? Oh yeah, yeah. Is this better? Yeah. Um, it depends on on what muscles I'm stretching. If I were to split my hamstrings, that is something that never feels good for my jumping if it's too flexible. Um, all my and then also my like groin. Weirdly enough, if it, if if I'm too flexible there, I, my jumping also starts feeling like shit. Um, 
my hips if i were to stretch like like my my glutes out a little bit um that usually doesn't feel like it'll impede my performance and then if i stretch my uh my hip flexors out that will usually feel good on my performance so the only static stretching that i would ever do before a dunk session um if any it would be would be couch stretch um but even then I, I i don't think i would i would do that before a session um there's when i was younger i i found that it that it would help out but now it doesn't really do anything um and the and the reason i used to do it when i was younger it was more so for knee pain and i think the couch stretch only helped my knee pain because my front leg was in an isometric position so i think that more so <laughs> played a role in, in warming me up and, and helping with, with the knee pain. I think that's, that is um, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people talk about static stretching as if it is this magic pill that is going to make everything better and it's going to heal your tendons and it's going to heal your connective tissue and it's going to make everything better. And we have a number of friends that preach that, that consistently believe that static stretching is the answer. And it's yeah. funny because if you were to look at things holistically and you would look at the other elements in their training – that are actually dictating whether or not they're getting hurt or not getting hurt in the, the connective tissue, you would consistently see that it's related to training load. The static stretching oftentimes adds training load that causes more problems in the connective tissue. And Jill Cook and Ebony Rio, time and time again, have demonstrated that. <laughs> Anecdotally, so this, go ahead. So this is another, another anecdote in, in terms of that. So there was, there was one contest, or it was a dunk show that me and CJ had to do in 2017. Um, during all-star weekend and I had done a dunk session to prep for it the, this was two days before before the contest I um, we did a not like a it was a short dunk session we exactly replicated what the dunks were going to be I went through my routine did it boom felt good knee felt a little weird right after my um, my session we went to to go stretch and then my my friend Jeff I was doing I was doing a cow stretch and then he came up to me he's like oh like you should try to go into it farther I'll help you go I'll, I'll help you go deeper into the stretch then he pushed my back leg so I was stretching my left leg he pushed my left leg into more flexion and then it felt like my my patella tendon just like snapped like like around the tibial tuberosity it just like felt horrible and then that was and John this was actually um Actually, no, this was right This was right before we worked together. But that was, like, the, the flare-up that led into the worst knee pain that I, that I, like, ever had. Like, ever since then, it just gradually got worse. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's, it was really, really, really bad for my tendon because I was stretching the tendon. I was putting more load into it. That's one of the things that add loads to a tendon. It's like, oh, it helped so much in the beginning. And then when you start to actually get flexible as a result and you start doing more static stretching, you realize it's not the static stretching that was making it better. It was something else, or it was you're opening yourself, you're opening those positions up. And if you're opening those positions up, then there might be some benefit, right? If there's yeah. less passive tension in the muscle and the tendon, maybe there's some added benefit to that. But when people are getting stupid flexible for no reason, to me, it's like, what's the point? What was the point of that? It served no well, purpose. <laughs> just something that I think some people like would help uh, when they look at you know the silver bullet on social media is you you have to think how many people are trying this intervention out and if it is a significant amount of people the likelihood that at least one person is going to have some crazy result is almost 100 percent. and you can't like discount one person's anecdotal story about how stretching saved their life just like any one thing i bet you can find online someone swearing it saved their life but <laughs> Uh, what you don't see is all of the other millions of people who have spent time becoming more flexible that aren't sharing their story on social media because they didn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's just like to keep that in mind that what you see online, you got to take into account how many people have probably tried this and what percentage of people that try this have seen the result that this one person is preaching. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say, though, uh, speaking about dunking specifically, and you can – take this point to whatever sport that you play there are positions that need to be hit i was about in your to say sport. This. i was about to say this there's two points we <laughs> haven't addressed about static stretching but continue with this one yeah there's there's a requisite uh flexibility that whatever sport you're doing requires 
And looking at dunking, for example, every elite dunker can get into some pretty ridiculous positions that like that dunking requires. Um, one of them being internal rotation. Um, really good dunkers have crazy internal rotation in their block foot. Um, two guys that, that is really fun to look at is T-Dub. T-Dub is literally like, like his like torso will be facing the hoop and then his hips are like facing almost backwards. And then his block foot's like facing 180 degrees away from the basketball hoop. Jordan Kilgannon is another one. Um, his block foot sweeps out really far and then comes in super internally rotated. And then the second thing is um, on the penultimate step, they, they usually have crazy, crazy flexibility um, at their hips. So they can go into a lot of hip extension. Um, and then the last thing is uh, being able to have a lot of ankle mobility too. That lets you just get deeper into, into your squat, into your jump. Um, so... Something that I would recommend for guys that are super, super tight. I have, I have a lot of friends that I've helped with this. If you're so tight that you can't get into a deep enough position that you can apply more force, spend more time applying force into the ground, that'll hurt your jump. And I think that would be a case where static stretching would, would help a lot. Um, can you give mind a specific you, example of that? Yeah. So my friend David is a, is a really good example. He has terrible ankle mobility. Um, and like no hip extension because of that. He's super high into his jump. He's like in a quarter squat when he's, when he's has both feet planted at the lowest part of his jump. Um, and because of that, right, it's, uh, I believe it's impulse, right? You spend more time applying force into the ground. You're, you're going to get a, a more powerful, a higher jump. If you can only go into a quarter squat, you only have that range of motion to apply force into the ground. If you can go into a deeper squat, and get there comfortably, you can spend all that time applying force into the ground. Um, so for him, we worked a lot on his ankle mobility, a lot on his hip extension. That way he can get lower into his jump, and that would allow him to jump higher as, as a result. Uh, so that would be an example um, where we would we would program in like st static stretching for, for athletes. Somebody like me, I've always been naturally flexible. I've always been able to, to deep squat. I worked on it a little bit when I was younger because I wasn't as flexible as, as I am now. Now, just by doing my weight training, by doing deep squats, by jumping, my flexibility is um, – I, I retain it because I'm practicing those, those ranges of motion through my sport. Um, so, yeah, that, that would be an example um, Yeah, how it could hurt you. I very much agree with especially the last thing that you said and what you said about David. It's very true. If I had a baseball player that couldn't get into – good external rotation to be able to get through the throw, that's going to be a focus for me if I can address it and, and actually make a difference. That said, just because you open up that mobility does not necessarily mean you'll be able to use it. The best way to actualize your mobility is to do the thing you want to get better at over and over and over again correctly. And you might not actually get into those end ranges that you developed in static stretching. Static stretching will give you the potential to get there, but it doesn't mean that when you go and do this very complex motor sequence that the muscles are going to shut off and certain agonists are going to turn on and there's not going to be passive tension. It doesn't necessarily mean that it might be wired in you to turn on certain muscles when they're not supposed to be on. And the way to get them to be optimized is to do the thing you want to get better at. Obviously you can't do that if you don't have the requisite mobility levels and that's where static flexibility comes in. If I'm trying to throw and I don't even have that position opened up, then I should be doing static stretching. But anything more than that is detrimental. And does it take a lot of mobility in the shoulder and the spine and the hips to throw a baseball hard? Compared to what I have, yes. Compared to a gymnast, no. Compared to a dancer, no. Compared to someone that can put their head between their knees, no. <laughs> Not even close. I think the requisite mobility is specific to what you're trying to do. If I'm a high jumper, I don't need any mobility. I really don't. I need hip extension. That's it. I, I don't even need dorsiflexion. Actually, there's evidence, and this is what I was lastly going to show, that increasing your range of motion or people with stiffer, less mobile ankles actually have greater elasticity in that tissue. There's, there's research that indicates that. And if you're increasing it beyond that, that to me would say I'm at risk 
of losing the thing that is maybe making me good at what I'm trying to do. I am losing the thing that is making me bouncy, especially in the ankle. I think in the ankle, it's probably the most prevalent. That is something when I was at Altus with the pro sprinters, I didn't see anyone with flexible ankles. All of them squat with their shins basically vertical. They didn't have the mobility to be able to squat deep. They just didn't. And you have to ask yourself, is that a specific adaptation that is happening in elite sprinters that's a good thing and what, what's making them good in the first place? Because you're going to be in dorsiflexion when you touch down if you're an elite sprinter, right? What if you're able to load that muscular tendinous unit better passively and reflexively, whatever else, however you want to say it, and get a greater return? It's a stiffer spring. You have a stiffer spring. Anecdotally, I've observed that. And this research is indicating that improving your range of motion more or that people who are generally less flexible in dorsiflexion have better elasticity. (laughs) I don't know. That's pretty clear cut anecdotally and in terms of evidence. I would just contend that, again, if you're a sprinter, I would not work on my ankle flexibility. Maybe if you want to get better at deep squatting or whatever else, you can work on it a little bit. I don't think that's going to be super detrimental unless you're a really tall guy. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't push it crazy far based on that research. I think further, if you're a high jumper, that you don't really want to address that either. You don't want to get crazy flexible ankles. I don't think you really need to get crazy flexible anything maybe other than your hip flexors and being able to get into hip extension because that is a very specific mobility that I have observed in elite high jumpers. If you want to jump high as a high jumper, as a speed jumper, as a power jumper, you have to be able to push freely through that penultimate step and get the pelvis into a good position. And that happens by being able to move into hip extension. If you're a one foot jumper and you're just practicing the penultimate step walking around, how you get that perfect alignment is by moving into hip extension. It's actually squeezing the glute on the free side leg, not the takeoff leg the swing leg as you push back. That's how you get that perfect alignment. That's how you get that pretty alignment. So being flexible there is going to be beneficial for you. It's going to make you make it easier to get more velocity, a lower position and get into a better takeoff position. That makes perfect sense to me. That's a mobility that is worth working on. Now, if that's going to cause injury, don't do it. (laughs) If you're going to push into a flexibility that is going to cause injury, like it did for me, because I'm a one foot jumper, why would I not want to maximize that? Well, because it tore my labrum and tore the anterior portion of my labrum. If you haven't listened to the Dean, the podcast with Dean, I would highly recommend doing that. That all said, we can kind of talk about, or do you guys have anything you want to add to that? Hunter? No. Well, one, I guess one thing too, uh, talking about dunking specifically, something that is a... And this is strictly for people that want to get good at, at dunking, um, not necessarily jumping high, is sh- like like your upper body shoulder mobility is ridiculous for the elite dunkers um, because you have to be able to do stuff like full extension windmills, um, behind the backs especially, um, a reverse behind the back, you're, you're going into crazy – like you're putting your arm as far back behind you as possible and then your other arm as well. Also, arm swings. If you're using a, a pendulum arm swing, bringing both arms back as far as you can. Um, so dynamically, you need to be have pretty insane mobility um, for that. And something that I see that uh, impedes a lot of guys that are trying to start doing the more complicated dunks, like between the legs and behind the back, um, you have to be really flexible um doing those motions but again the best way to get better at that is just to actually practice the dunks low rim them a shit ton if you're extremely tight i would probably do static flexibility until you can at least like like grab the ball behind you and then from there is just practice a lot Mm -hmm. yeah all those things said i think we can move on to that's kind of a specific dunking thing but yeah, yeah, maybe a, a good anecdote or some specific example that you guys can use as it applies to other sports. We can talk about dynamic flexibility. What is it? How does it help you? If you don't know what static flexibility is, real quick, it's just holding the stretch. <laughs> it's going to the end range and holding it. Dynamic flexibility is moving that joint through the full range of motion and getting and just touching that end range. 
Sometimes it can be ballistic where ballistic is bouncing. A lot of people will just kind of lump them in together as ballistic as a type of dynamic flexibility. That said, dynamic flexibility, anecdotally, or our experiences with it, works super well. <clears throat> Improves my mobility. Did not help me avoid issues with my improves flexibility. It actually increased or decreased my fat percentage and increased my body composition. It improved my core warmth and core temp, decreased my incidence of injury, and it has been shown in research to improve performance. I'm getting a call right now. Hopefully it's not coming through there. And it's been shown to also uh, improve performance. If you are doing a holistic warm up and you are pretty mobile and you are very mobile, as a coach, I'm going to recommend that you do dynamic flexibility because dynamic flexibility is going to achieve all of those goals. And in research, time and time again, those results have been demonstrated. Groups that do dynamic flexibility do see improvements in vertical jump after doing it acutely. They do not see a decrement in performance after doing dynamic flexibility. They do see an increase in core temp. It does add volume. It can potentially decrease the incidence of injury because it is increasing your core warmth and it's increasing your tissue compliance. To me, much better option. <laughs> I think static flexibility is for people that are not flexible and otherwise you should be doing dynamic flexibility. Isaiah, Hunter, thoughts? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been doing dynamic flexibility for two years now, like basically every single day through our warm ups, and that's maintained my level of flexibility. And not only, I mean, it, it warms you up, but it also like, in terms of like mindset, it's a lot better too because it's like, in by through its nature, it's more explosive. Like, like for example, when I'm doing a leg swing. I'm, I'm on, on my toe, so I'm doing isometric with my calf, and then I'm, I'm kicking my leg, and I feel that stretch. It feels like jumping, right? Because when I jump, let's say I take my penultimate step, I feel that strong stretch in my hamstring on my front leg, um, like, like we, we found out two days ago <laughs> when I was doing my plant. Um, you feel a strong contraction in the back leg on your hamstring when you push off. It feels just like what you're, you're going to experience um, when you jump, and it, and it helps you warm that up safely right because when you're doing a dynamic flexibility you don't have to be kicking as hard as you can you you start like john said touching that end range and then as you warm up um your tissues become more compliant more warm you start being able to get farther into that end range and i've seen a visible difference in my vertical jump if i were to jump and this is like how you would do a control study if you were to jump right before and do dynamic flexibility you would jump higher right afterwards whereas you wouldn't see that with static stretching yeah I definitely think that's the the same case for me. And Hunter, I don't know if you have any anecdotes here on dynamic flexibility with as being a or coming from a baseball background. But uh, what is, yeah, what's your I mean, I think dynamic flexibility is the way to go. It's not something that I've I've always been uh, I've not always prioritized, and I've been a bad athlete of John Evanson's coaching. Wait, you don't uh, do the dynamic not flexibility? Doing it. Uh, sometimes I skip it. Have you done but the ISOs? Uh, at least? I do it. Do you do the and, ISOs? Uh, Check out day. No, 14, no, 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 no. I want you to stop speaking. Stop speaking. Stop happens. speaking. Do you do the full warm up every day? Every day? Yeah. No. <sighs> Isaiah, no, no, what? But I do now. What fate awaits, Hunter? So what happened is, is I, I did it every day, and then when I decided to go rogue and do really heavy jump back squats, and I hurt myself, mm -hmm. I came back and didn't do them when I came back. And that makes then, sense. That's fair. Because you didn't, then, you, uh, it would have been contraindicated at the time. And then uh, day 14 came, the day uh, I was like, you know what, I'm going to give this thing a go. And uh, Wait, 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 wait. Well. So you're telling me the day you jumped the highest you've ever jumped in your entire life on a 10-foot rim, you did an entire dynamic warm-up. Dynamic flexibility and Shockingly, entire warm-up. Shockingly, yes. Shockingly, yes. Isaiah, what can be gained from this conversation as a third party? Start warming up. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 you know, just, just 
peep the Instagram to see what happens when you do the dynamic warm up. Mm, it just pisses me off. And, and you're gonna and you're gonna do the entire warm up today and dunk today. Oh, for sure. Call it today it. it's going call it down. It. Hunter, if you don't hit your first dunk today, I'm gonna be amazed. It's gonna ta- have taken you two weeks to hit your first dunk ever. How close were you? How many inches were you off? I was probably like two inches off when I started. Oh, two inches in two weeks. That's that's crazy. <laughs> Real quick. We need to close this because I feel like we've talked about dynamic flexibility. We've talked about static flexing, st- static stretching. We've get, gone over the research. We told you guys everything. Let's give a little update about our, our training right now. Some of you guys might be interested in that. If you're listening this far along, you're probably somewhat invested in what we're doing. Hunter, you are up two inches. Your bird is up two inches in two weeks. Maybe, yeah. maybe three inches today. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking, if you're watching on YouTube, it went from, I could probably get like mid palm above the rim when I started, started training again. And then now it's solidly um, like right below my wrist. So I'd say it's probably. That's like two to three inches. inches. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that's been, um, you know, if you actually use your resources as an athlete and you discuss proper form with John and Isaiah, that can help. And then the training itself uh, has been a style of training that I've never really done to the intensity that this block has been. Um, and it's been, it's been, uh, it's been fun. <laughs> Hunter's training. I've been discussing every day on my story. And if you guys are interested in that, you definitely should check it out. I usually discuss why I'm doing certain things, or I might just qu- leave a quick note. Like he's being withholding like yesterday when he posted a jump video and I'm like, this is not the jump I wanted to see. <laughs> yeah. So I apologize guys. I'm not the best social media poster. So technically I'm a few days behind on the posting per day. So today might be day like 17 and I just posted day 13. So I just got to get better about posting, but day 14 is a good day. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Is that what we're seeing? Are you posting day 14 today? Day 14. I can post this afternoon because I already did. I posted day 13 today. Day 13 was an off day. So I just did a post about creatine supplementation. So I'll post day 14 tonight, I guess. And that'll be a good post. And then I'll be one day closer to actually being on track. So today, I think it's day 17. Yeah, today's This day is the 17. day, baby. This is the day. <laughs> also, just so you guys know, Hunter is a very well-trained athlete. He's actually done the programming previously. He has done jump training before, and it is actually pretty staggering from my perspective to see how much he's improved, taking into consideration a lot of those things. From the very beginning, I would say Hunter's vertical has gone up. I don't even know. How much has your vertical gone up from the beginning? Could you touch, could you grab room with your fingertips when you started? Yeah. Um, so I'll post a video if you want of me jumping like from about a year ago before like even meeting John and you can see the form difference <laughs> and the height difference, but um, it's very, it's very noticeable how much more confident you feel as a jumper. Like I used to jump and some days would be good. Some days would be bad. Some days it'd be at the end of warm ups or pickup games. And I would never really know why I was jumping higher or lower or like what was contributing to all this stuff. Uh, but since like really focusing on John's training and using Isaiah, um, especially as like a skill acquisition coach, I would say not that I, know, I can I do go that. into it. I can go. John, Sorry. Fuck you, <laughs> you, John. But I'm like, the I dad. Can go into a gym and I can start jumping and I can tell like, oh, this is gonna be a good day or it's gonna be a bad day. And I and like I know why it's a bad day. Whereas before I didn't know. Now it's like, oh, like I didn't warm up properly or I'm not exploding off my back foot enough or like I'm staying on the ground for too long you know, or, or what have you. Like things that I just didn't even. So I was talking with John about this yesterday, the four stages of competence. At first, you're unconsciously incompetent. Then you're consciously incompetent. Then you're consciously competent. And then you're unconsciously competent. And before I started training with John and Isaiah, I was unconsciously incompetent, which means I didn't even know how bad I was. And then starting training with them, I realized (laughs) I was at least conscious about how bad I was. And now I think there are certain jumps where I'm consciously competent, but I'm not yet even close to unconsciously competent. Mm -hmm. Well, all of that said, he's improving a lot and I'm super excited about it and it's going to continue to get better because Hunter is super powerful and super strong and he is good at connecting the dots himself which makes my job a lot easier. Isaiah, where are you at? Tell, tell, let's talk about the progress in the last couple of months. People don't, people don't know what's going on. Yeah, let's yeah. Go. So I've been dealing with tendinopathy in the most random place possible uh, at the Greater Trochanter. 
tendon that connects my vast lateralis uh, to the greater trochanter. Um, it's been really bad. I had jumped through it since April. Uh, I would say about a month and a half ago, two months ago, me and John realized how bad it actually was and that we should probably focus on <laughs> taking care of it. Ever since then, I went from it hurting to squat 95 pounds to now I'm squatting 315 with less than a three uh, pain. Uh, I'm doing one step jumps, touched 11, four off of one step. Technically, it's two steps, but we, we call the penultimate <laughs> just, just one step. Um, and yeah, that's progressing up nicely. Um, should be back to dunking pretty soon. And yeah, super excited. Today, I'm actually jumping. So I actually have to talk to John about what, <laughs> what exactly we're doing today. But Exciting stuff. Um, yeah. What about you, John? Where are you at? Well, real quick, I just want to say you're welcome, both of you. I love you, too. You're like a brother to me. <laughs> Hunter's a laser. He's just laser focused. He's got other things he's got to focus on, like making sure the podcast doesn't crash. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trying to be a guest while also being a host. I'm like young Jamie, <laughs> but also Joe Rogan's like host. I mean, guest. <laughs> so I am currently working on speed jumping. I We have lockdowns here in Pittsburgh, and I didn't have access to anything really that I needed to to dunk. I also was pretty banged up at the time. I pulled my... Rec fem, actually. I've never done that before, but I was jumping higher, and the court was really small, which made the approach and my lob really difficult, and I kind of had to readjust things, and it just, I really had to dial in my approach more, which did end up helping quite a bit in terms of absolute jumping height, and I was able to dunk more consistently, which also helped a ton, but at the end of the day, I got hurt because I got emotional, had a bunch of stressors in my life outside of training and stuff and just was pushing too hard too soon i think i took like 80 jumps one session the, the session i did the throw in you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. 80 it 80 was probably jumps? 80 maybe more off one foot like full approach Dude, we, we just real quick we have an athlete of ours who will like randomly whatsapp us today's jump session was good three hours in the books <laughs> what? it's probably tom what? barnes <laughs> yeah, I I mean it, it does help. Like that's how you get better, but if you don't know your body and you don't know your limits or even if you do and you don't have someone there to hold you accountable, it's very easy to get hurt very quickly. Yeah, this guy also sleeps 12 hours a day and takes a nap. So Nice. <laughs> he's got like no stressors outside of jumping. Nice. I had a lot of other stressors. I had business, I had personal stuff, I had all this other random stuff, my parents, my family, whatever. And that kind of I had to pump the brakes on training a little bit for a little while. I was still doing strength work, so I was still maxing out uh, like my strength work as much as I could. I was trying to push that up as high as I possibly could because I knew it would help me stay healthy as well as improve my performance. And then I was training through this quarantine, had some more personal stuff come up with the death of my grandfather and my grandma getting COVID and getting a puppy and craziness, and it made it hard to train. But the whole time I was going to the track during that quarantine, that three month it wasn't quarantine. It was just lockdowns. I was able to go to the, go to the track and get in speed jumping sessions and we'll have Matt on the podcast tomorrow, which would be really good. And I can really go into the details, but basically I increased my approach vertical off my right foot, probably three inches in three weeks or something like that. Is that right? Hunter, Isaiah, have you seen a hunter, the picture? Yeah. From I mean, the, the picture you're trying to touch the yeah, thing yeah. with your head, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah I was, that was insanity. Yeah, it was insane. <laughs> Especially because Isaiah's seen, Isaiah's probably been watching that progression for, since I knew him, since I've known him, but on the left foot. And then I switched to the right foot probably two years ago, been working on it. And it's just slowly mm -hmm. climbed up and gotten better and better and better. And one of the biggest things that helped with this, and if you're listening to this, maybe pin this, this timestamp, and then we'll close it here. <laughs> I started counting my steps and doing rehearsal drills. And I hate drills. I think they're stupid. But what I've realized is that it created context so that I could anticipate the takeoff better. And if you listen to my previous podcast, you know how important anticipation is. You have to be able to anticipate your takeoff. Being able to know when your takeoff is coming, when you're a one foot jumper is so important because everything happens so fast. Your brain needs to start preparing way, way before you actually get to that takeoff. So by counting out loud, I would go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, three. And I would speed it up and just feeling the pressure of the curve and feeling the approach, looking up at my target and just being really confident that I could hit it if I could just get more of 
the sensation that I was chasing or more aggression, I just jumped way higher. I think I'll, I, I don't know when I'm going to get it. I'm definitely going to hit my head off that soon, I think, now that I've kind of figured this out this week. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. If you guys are still listening here, make sure that you guys share it, like, comment, subscribe. If you guys are listening to it as a podcast or as a YouTube, share it on your story. We will repost you if we see it. And then maybe you'll get more followers. Maybe you'll get more notoriety if you're a dunker or whatever else, or if you're just an athlete or a coach. Help us help you, and you help us help us. (laughs) But that's all, guys. Algorithm gods. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you on tomorrow's episode. Peace out. Yep, later.